Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details. Welcome to Hong Kong Confidential. I'm Jules Hannaford and I'm your host. I'm an Australian woman and I've been living in Hong Kong for many years. I'm a mother, a teacher, an author, and I want to share my wisdom and the wisdom of others with you. Thanks for joining me and I hope you enjoy the show. Today I'm here with Angela Watkins. Hi, Angela. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Well, I'm as good as could be expected. Yes, we're all social distancing at the moment because of the coronavirus. So it's actually quite ironic because all of my interviews for Hong Kong Confidential are done in person. And the irony is the first one that I do as a recording is with you to talk about the impact of the coronavirus. So that's quite interesting. Yes, and I have to thank you for that because uh, you forced me into a whole era of technology that I've been unfamiliar with and I guess we all have the opportunity to learn new things in a time of crisis. Yes, we do, and we've certainly upskilled ourselves by doing all of our teaching by Zoom, so that's been quite amazing. Angela, as a psychologist in Hong Kong, what sort of issues do you normally deal with with people? So normally in our business, we deal with teens, uh, both those with special educational needs and teen, typical teens, adults uh, who have either anxiety and depression or having relationship issues or are undergoing some sort of career change decisioning and therefore would benefit from talking to a counsellor or a psychologist about those matters. So one of the reasons why I contacted you is because I saw an article that was published about the impact that the coronavirus has on people's mental health. So I thought it'd be a great idea to have a chat to you. Have you been seeing more people related to the coronavirus recently and has it been causing more stress in the community, do you think? Oh, it's certainly causing more stress in the community. I mean, it's very much the topic du jour and everyone feels anxious. Uh, client cases are probably not jumping up like some epidemic on their own. What we do see is clients, even if we were talking about their relationship-related issues, the anxiety around coronavirus has entered all of those equations. So you might be having a couple in counselling, and this is a topic that's also caused, maybe causing friction in a relationship that already has friction. So there's no avoiding this topic in everyone's lives at the point in time, and everyone is feeling anxious it's quite a normal and probably a healthy reaction to this event that we feel anxious. That's not a bad thing to feel anxious. It's a normal response to such a large amount of uncertainty. So you're saying that it's not a bad thing. So what are the positives that can come out of having that anxiety? Let's look at anxiety as something you can respond to negatively and you can respond to positively. So what we see in the negative space is Let's say, uh, I'm going to call them offloaders. So I feel anxious, and so in order for me to get over my anxiety, I actually go online and I spread, oh, I've heard this rumor about this, or this is going to happen, or, you know, thinking I'm going to die, or someone I know is going to die, or basically spreading my panic. And often offloaders will feel better once they've put their question out there, but actually what they're doing is offloading their anxiety. And it will come back. It's not a way of dealing with anxiety. It literally is an avoidance of anxiety. It's just saying, I don't want to deal with it, so I'll put it somewhere else. Another thing you consider, we all know what FOMO is now, fear of missing out. Well, I'm going to try and coin the term FOMU, which is fear of messing up. Because I think that's the other thing we get from social media is, is you think, oh, this thing has happened and I don't know. And you actually think, oh, you know, could me or my kids get sick as a consequence of me not knowing this information, or me not being able to get away or me not being able to navigate this situation. The reality of that, the situation is it's so uncertain. We do not know the course of this epidemic. We don't know when it will be over. We know how to try and keep ourselves safe. And that's pretty much all we know. So when we try to avoid messing up, 
we make ourselves extra anxious. So then there's a positive spin on anxiety. Anxiety is a normal reaction to uncertainty. That is part where you can actually embrace it. You can say, okay, it's like a small, monstrous child that lives in your soul. Think about it that way. So it, it agitates you. It's difficult. But you can take the hand of that child and try and comfort it instead of ignoring it or instead of exacerbating it. You can say to yourself, hey, I feel anxious. I do feel anxious. This is an uncertain time. I don't feel good about this. But you can also then start to comfort yourself to say, okay, I will do the things that I can to try and minimize my risk, to minimize the risk to my family. And I can try and take some form of control. Control is a lovely entity in the psychology space. It's bad to be controlling, but controlling is the typical response to anxiety. When you feel things are back in your control, you naturally feel less anxious about them. You can't control the path of this epidemic. We can all play our small role, but you can't make it all go away. You can't even now run away. There is nowhere to run away to. There is nowhere this virus doesn't affect. You're not going to get on a plane. If you get on a plane, you're going to be in isolation or, you know, to be asked to be quarantined. So that is not the way forward. The way forward is to use um, more embracing activity. So the cure to anxiety, I would frame as kindness is one thing and self-care is the other. So what I mean by self-care is it is looking after yourself, trying to keep a routine at these points in time is quite helpful. Go for a walk in a small area, keeping away from everybody. Take charge of your home environment for a change, the cooking. And then the second part of that is, you know, can I care for my community? So one of the things that we've been doing, that I've been doing myself, is we've set up a online book club for women. It's called Co-Read 19. Very cool name, not mine. I was very impressed by the suggestion. But the reality is people want to stay connected, um, but we want to keep them apart. So what do we do? Well. You know, Jules Hadfield has sent me an invitation to be on a Zoom interview. Now I have to learn Zoom. So now I'm extending my Zoom knowledge to offer other people an opportunity to connect with each other on a platform that they might like. Isn't that brilliant? Like this is a way that people could actually hang out with their girlfriends and have a wine on a Friday night, but just do it on Zoom. Exactly. No alcohol bar at Co-Red 19. Oh, so you can bring bring your wine to the book club? I don't Great. think you can control other people's home environment. <laughs> no, but that's really nice. And I think there are things that people can still do for their well-being to bring the anxiety levels down. And I think one of the things is staying off social media as much as possible, isn't it? And not getting caught up in reading everything you see about it because it can just heighten your anxiety for a number of people, would you say? I think that you need to be, you need to audit a couple of things here, especially on your social media. On your social media, people say a lot of stuff that isn't, that doesn't end up being the truth, or they won't go back to the source of the information. So today, we have probably an announcement about ID exams. I mean, this is a big flurry of activity around it at the moment, and I have a school leaver, so it's going to affect her. So my child is currently doing some ID certificates, and so she will be affected by whatever the IDO decide. And... I may not like their outcome, probably pretty likely I won't, but the reality is we have to work with what we have. So she will either set the exams at another time or she'll go with whatever she has already. And I feel bad for these kids. These kids will will be the corona kids, if if you like. It is very, very tough for kids setting exams this year. There is no doubt about that. And all we can do is share how unfair it is with them. I think people have to take this opportunity to audit their lives, their social media participation in the following ways. There's two ways I I, I would recommend. Number one is the sources of information at this point in time are really important. There's lots of rumors. There's lots of speculation over whether flights are going to get canceled, whether exams are going to get canceled. Knowing early and wanting to know early is part of this fear of messing up scenario. Nothing is going to change if you know when the official communication comes out versus the non-official. So whilst you're trying to control and take charge of the situation, just remember, go back to the original source if you can. Go back to the World Health Organization data. It still is not great, but it is a source of better information than rumor. And then the second thing 
I want you to take some time to audit your friendships. Are they offloading? Is communicating with them making you feel better or making you feel worse? So this is a way that anxiety can spread throughout the community, isn't it? If people are catastrophizing and making things seem worse than you think they might be. They could even be in some form of catastrophe club. And the time is to say, okay, you know, when we can get in charge of situations, maybe a catastrophe club is, is funny, but this is a very big unknown. So this is only feeding your sense of lack of control. And you're not controlling the situation by spreading more information or more misinformation. That's not how you're spreading the information. You you can control the situation better by self-care, by looking after yourself, by volunteering in your community, by trying to be the person that you want to be. Let's say that this moment in time is how you're going to be defined, how you respond. Do you want to be the person who shares rumors or do you want to be the person who provides solutions or who's trying to reconnect communities? So another thing that I've been doing with my online community is a lot of women in the same kind of threads as I am on Facebook are crafters. So I said, oh, can we try and set up a craft fair after this is all done for our corona stuff? And, you know, that focuses people crafting activities. They are crafting for a goal. And we've already decided that some of those earnings would go to a charity as well. So suddenly people are crafting with a purpose. They feel... And that calms their anxiety. That just calms the whole spirit. Volunteering is known from much of the psychological research to reduce anxiety in people because they can see that there are people worse off than them. And that actually allows us to calm ourselves and say, hey, look, my life is okay. For example, we may be in Hong Kong in a situation of stay at home where it's heavily encouraged, but you actually can go outside and we may be at the end of our tether of homeschooling our kids, but our kids are safe. And there will be a time that they will be educated in a different way. And different kids struggle in different ways at this point in time. So, for example, the most hard-hit group in our families are probably teenagers because teenagers, essentially, the whole teenage years is about independence and independence has been suspended in this point in time you know our kids are not leaving the house potentially maybe not having exams which would launch their university careers they're not able to connect with their friends who are very much how they define themselves at this time so it's very hard on teenagers in particular so we have the anxiety of the illness and also their failure to launch scenarios being impacted so that's a concern for them I, and I think the way forward for teenagers is really just to listen to them about how unfair this is, because it is. It is really unfair. And we don't have to solve unfair. Unfair is unfair. And it's about letting them vent and talking about how they're feeling and expressing how they feel. And that also helps to manage anxiety as well, doesn't it? The kids, so if they can't learn in a regular environment, what can your kids learn? That would reduce their anxiety. If they're still achieving some and, and also, let's not say learning goal is their school goal. Learning goal is their emotional development goal in those years, intellectual and emotional development at this time. So very young children under the age of five, I think you don't necessarily have to worry about their schooling or their anxiety so much at this point in time because mom and dad are home. If mom and dad could stay cool, calm and collected and manage their own anxiety, These little kids get to benefit from being with their parents and and engaging with their parents more often than they typically would, and that's probably something they enjoy very much. How do you think that anxiety can impact people on a day-to-day basis, dealing with the anxiety that they're feeling about the coronavirus? Well, anxiety is very hard on the body and very hard on the spirit. So let's not deny that. That's why I'm also saying, you know, listen to the anxiety. Don't fight it. You know, anxiety that you fight doesn't go away. So listen to yourself. Be kind. If you've done things, for example, I went out to a gathering probably 10 days ago, and I think now maybe I shouldn't have done that. You have to have a little bit of self-forgiveness as well. It may not have been, you know, I wouldn't do that today, but I did that 10 days ago. And that I think we have to forgive ourselves for the things that we've done that when we didn't know better. Uh, now you know better. Now you know better. You do better. This week, I'm going to be working from home and learning how to use Zoom. Great. Well, I'm glad I've been able to help with that. 
So what about fake news, Angela? Do you think that that's playing a part in heightening the global anxiety? Because we just don't necessarily know what is real and what is fake. I think that there is lazy reporting. So, for example, you can just watch the numbers and they will just tally over. There's a time you can see that reporters are just waiting for these sort of stories to come out. For example, more people dying of COVID-19 than SARS. You know, that was a moment they were just waiting. They'd already written the story, but then they just had to wait for the numbers. And then we have Italy more than China and we have over 10,000 deaths. And these are lazy stories. You know, you get your number of lines and words that you have to do as a reporter out, but they don't, you're not educating anyone, you're not helping. There's also a, some fake news about, for example, there was the people spreading misinformation about how you can detect if you have COVID-19 by holding your breath and these sorts of things, which all get borne out as fake news in the long run by medical experts. I think that's the same as what normally goes around in social media quite frequently. Go back yeah, to the we, thoughts. Yeah, we all have to be discerning with whatever we read on the internet because it's becoming more and more fake. How can individuals relieve their anxiety and stress levels? Now, you've talked about group things and you've talked about Zoom and you've talked about doing crafting and activities like that. Creativity is very good for the soul. Yeah. What are some other things that people can do that still can be implementing social distancing, but it's good for their anxiety levels? Okay, so I would suggest, coming back to creativity, I think creativity is a really great way that has quite a lot of research attached to it. So we have journaling, we have colouring, we have meditation, we have exercise, all as great anxiety management techniques that you can engage in. Of course, we also have counselling as an activity that reduces anxiety and is well proven by psychological research to make an impact on your experience of anxiety. So we can also look at making your environment more manageable at this time. Even from my own personal experience, we had to zone our house into where one takes calls. So we've now created more opportunities for us to engage with each other over the day. So we sit down and we have dinner together. Uh, we have these moments where we are together more because togetherness is a really important element of anxiety reduction. We get to talk around the table about not just the COVID-19 stories, but just anything that you learned in the classroom, what's happening in life. We normalize is a good way to reduce your anxiety. So there are lots of experiments on social isolation they're quite extreme ones. They're people where they've been incarcerated or you, of course, have the long walk home autobiography of Nelson Mandela of his time in isolation on Robbins Island when he didn't have contact with other people. And what we learn from that is routine is really important. Knowing who you are, knowing who you want to be, having a concept of yourself that is greater than your environment is very important. And this is where something like an idea like a journal would also be helpful. Journaling doesn't have to be the account of my day. Journaling can be in response to certain prompts. So you can ask yourself, you know, what is my best version of myself? How do I deal with anxiety? How do I deal with conflict? And write about those things so that you can learn about yourself at this point in time. Yeah, I think that that's all really good advice. And also for people who are alone, like me, so I'm on my own at home. I don't have anybody to interact with or talk to. And I think that the social isolation can be a little bit more difficult when you don't have other people in the home to interact with. I think your advice of getting into crafting clubs or joining the book club or me mentioning doing Zoom with friends or even reaching out and speaking on the phone can be super helpful. And the other thing that I found really helpful is doing a bit of yoga. So even putting on a video and doing some yoga at home, that can be really nice just to alleviate that stress and take your mind off all the things that you have to do and the worries and being alone. And the other thing I found really helpful, and luckily I live on Lama, so we've got a lot of nature around us, but just getting out and going for a walk on my own and listening to music has been really, really helpful for me. So they're all little tips that I've done to alleviate my level of stress. And I commend you, Jules, you're doing all the right things. So well done to you. I think that one of the things that when you're out in nature is, you know, take those earphones out sometimes and listen to the bird song and 
these sorts of things you notice for example when you deal with a lot of depressed people they don't actually notice how beautiful nature is that's one of the things that depressed people lose is their ability to look outside of their own kind of cold bubble and see birds and sunlight and leaves and how pretty things are so yes go and enjoy those things I was wondering, I guess, whether having that level of anxiety also then keeps people vigilant about their personal hygiene and not touching railings and making sure that they're wearing masks in public. And do you think that that sort of level of just awareness and stress and anxiety has been helpful in keeping our numbers down in Hong Kong? For a start, I think we have two pools of numbers in Hong Kong that you have to be mindful of. We have an import number, which is problematic in that it is going up and we can't stop people coming home and we need to be mindful that our hospitals can only deal with a certain number of cases and they're going to have to deal with those import cases. So the ones we have to really be mindful of is the person-to-person spread. All the things you're saying, hand washing, social isolation, distancing from others, all of these are helpful. I still have to do face-to-face with some of my clients. Normally when they come in, they love the fact that my office smells of bleach and that has become the new thing that people like to smell. You know, we will ceremoniously wrap their mask in tissue and we will, they will go and wash their hands and we have all these protocols and that helps them relax because they know that as much as I can, I'm trying to make that environment as safe as I can. I can't eliminate all risk, but we can eliminate some risk. They're all good tips for all of us when we have to interact with people, I think, that if people follow those guidelines. And it's not just in Hong Kong, it's globally at the moment. And I've got lots of listeners from, uh, you know, 120 countries around the world. So this is really good advice for everybody, not just for people in Hong Kong. One of the reasons that your podcast is so successful is on the back of Fool Me Twice, which was exactly a situation which was a crisis. So... Sometimes out of really bad stuff comes really great things. Yeah, and it just helps you build your resilience and it helps you understand that you are capable of dealing with more than you thought you could and that you are capable of making rational decisions and that you can learn from what's going on. And I think that's one of the things that Hong Kong have done so well now is because they learned from SARS back in 2004 or whenever it was. Because we'd been through that, I think they went to action stations very quickly and made some very good decisions about closing schools, and that's been really helpful for Hong Kong. So there's an example of a city learning from its past as well. I agree. Hong Kong and and our doctors and our nurses here are to be commended. A lot of them have trained, not only have experienced SARS themselves, but because Hong Kong was an epicenter of the SARS outbreak, All our new doctors and nurses are taught these protocols and how to manage those situations in a responsible way. They're not learning these things for the first time. Having said that, they are still tested to the max, these people at the moment. And whatever we can do to make their jobs easier, I would encourage members of the community to do. And that's another lucky aspect for Hong Kong, that testing for the virus is very easily available to everybody. And that's unfortunately not the case in other countries like the US, I understand. So that's another thing that Hong Kong's getting right. So at the moment, there are a lot of parents around the world having their children working from home, online learning for homeschooling. What sort of stresses do you think these parents face and what advice would you have for them? Hong Kong has been having the online schooling experiment going for eight weeks. We're the veterans of this world, it seems like, at eight weeks. I think that you have to decide what is right for your family in this. I mean, I've had to make some decisions for my children. My 17-year-old, I've asked for her study leave to start early because she was basically being truant and I was receiving lots of messages that she was missing classes. So the reality is if I'm at home, I can manage her, just make sure that she actually does the things that she needs to do. And hopefully her exams will go ahead and hopefully she will end her school career on a meh rather than a fantastic note, but it will it will be what it will be. I think we need to observe our children. So if they're just in their rooms all day, pretty much by themselves, it feels like. I think we need to be careful that that's not great for teenagers. That's not great for little kids. 
So do engage with them, be their social world, because that's all parents can be. The social world that our kids have at the moment is their parents. They don't have access to their friendships. You might want to talk to your child about how they can maintain friendships in a virtual world for a while because, you know, they typically are friends with the people who they see every day. And when that is taken away, many kids don't have a capability to make friendships or maintain friendships without that. And so it's something that we we as parents can try to help them with, to try and work with them on how can you maintain this, you might even learn something about the technology yourself, about TikTok and, you know, how, what they're doing on Insta and all the rest of it to try and maintain some of their friendships. If your child is a primary school age child and not on any of these platforms because they're legally not supposed to be, then you could just help them swap videos with their friends by sending videos to their parents and you could swap videos. So at least they have those moments of seeing their friends being silly or doing something fun so that they can stay connected and know that those people are still part of their world. And I think as a parent, we have a responsibility to make the children aware of what's going on and talking to them about what's happening in the world in a rational, calm way, but also not oversharing our fears so that we instill more sort of panic and anxiety in our children. Would you agree? It's finding that fine balance, which can be difficult. I agree completely. I think one of the problems we're going to have after this issue is a potential sort of PTSD element. And what impacts that is how we deal with our own stress at this point in time. Your child is not your counsellor. They don't know the situation better than you. I had a conversation with my 13-year-old yesterday who was having a meltdown and telling me that, you know, she wasn't going to catch the virus. Why shouldn't she go and see her friends? And, you know, I found having to actually explain more and more of the situation than I had maybe wanted to previously to the extent I had to say to her it is a bit like the Spanish plague this is not like SARS this is a bad problem I don't know the outcome I wish I did I just know what to do to try and make the outcome a little bit better yeah and we just have to try to keep everybody safe at this point so many people coming back into Hong Kong are going into quarantine for 14 days now and how do you think that they can manage this on both a practical level and from a well-being point of view as well? Okay, well, you and I both live on the outskirts. So, you know, if you're going to Lama or you're coming to Sheng Shui where I live, like, you know, you might have a little bit more of a challenging time, but we have great delivery services in Hong Kong. If you have friends in Hong Kong, you can get a lot of things delivered. I actually think that people would help you stay quarantined and deliver things to you if you would allow them to. Well, so, I've seen on Hong Kong mums that they've got a support group of people who are helping people who are quarantined. I haven't looked into it, but I do know that there's some sort of community, some support being rallied at the moment. I have friends as well who have just come back from overseas and are in quarantine. And, you know, I've said, look, I'll deliver books or, you know, a box of chocolates or a crate of wine or tell me what you need and I might pop it outside your door and ring the doorbell and run away like a small child. The point of it is that people don't like being locked down, but there are lots of different varieties of that. Now, what we've seen from quarantine breakers in Hong Kong is they were supposed to be in quarantine in the care of their own home where they had access to their TV and their fridge and their cooker. And then if you break it now, the Hong Kong government is putting you in their version of a quarantine center, which is a very different scenario. So yes, your quarantine can get a lot worse. So that's one thing to consider. It's yeah, so that's good things. advice not to break the quarantine. Yeah, for sure. And, I, and I'm happy that the Hong Kong government did that because I can see a lot of hostility towards the population of people who are not being mindful of their responsibility. And maybe they don't believe they're at risk, but we do. So what advice would you give to somebody who's being complacent and doesn't think that the virus is really a threat to them and they're not observing good hygiene practices or social distancing at the moment? Well, I guess two things. Number one is do it for others if you don't want to do it for yourself. And secondly, think about whether you would be happy having your whole history shown out in the hospital authorities report, you know, where every bus you've been on, every gym you've been to, every place you've been to, every person you've had contact with, this is what's going to happen potentially if you test positive. And, you know, would you be happy with the actions that you have taken? That's why I'm saying also, you know, okay, I'm going to throw you a lifeline of self-forgiveness because we all 
when we don't know better, we don't do better. But when we do know better, we can do better. What is 14 days in your life? Seriously, you can't join a book club and read a book for 14 days? I can send you a membership. Hello, I want to go to my yoga class. And I'm like, well, download a yoga video. I mean, seriously, are there no yoga videos available to you on YouTube or on Netflix or on Apple TV or any of the channels you have? There is no way for you to exercise indoors or limit that from going to a yoga class. And what advice would you have for somebody who is feeling panicked about COVID-19 and feels that they're not coping? So not coping is a, is a very different situation. It's an extreme situation. I would download some guided meditations from YouTube. I think that those, you know, really try and get your breathing and your actual panic response under control. That's really important. And then the maintenance is these activities like coloring and journaling. Allow yourself to have this internal dialogue with your anxiety monster. This monster is there because he or she is actually saying to you, hey, there's danger. Yes, there is danger. It is not nice. It is not great that you don't know the outcome of what the situation will be. But it's also okay that you don't know that. You can be okay and still not know. You can live with what is going on if you can just get through it. And so what do you need to do just to get through it? Yeah, that's excellent advice. I think that's really, really good. And it's about just following the guidelines. We've got guidelines for good hygiene. We've got guidelines for social distancing. You just have to follow them. And yeah, you, maybe you have to miss a party or you can't go hang out with your friends, but there are other ways around it. So Angela, what do you think the long-term effects of this pandemic will be on individuals in the community in the future? As I said, I think that we will see the benefits of leadership. I think I would hope that Hong Kong Confidential, having tackling this topic head on, will do extremely well and grow its audience. I think that we know that there's probably going to be some PTSD-related elements of post-traumatic stress disorder. A community can stay quite anxious for quite a period. There can be a lot of fear. There can also be the exact opposite, you know, quite danger-seeking behavior, like I am invincible after all. So we're going to have some of that PTSD fallout. Uh, we also will have, of course, the economic shock that is coming. So if you were thinking about changing your career or you want to discuss your career plan with a coach or a counselor, I would suggest that you maybe consider being proactive in that position. That doesn't mean you're going to be downsized. It's always good to, to future-proof your own career. I think that we need to... Be mindful of our small communities, our small businesses in our communities. When you come back, go to that local craft fair and buy those things from those crafters who made stuff during COVID-19 or go to your local restaurant. They're going to need your business. We need to be in this together. We need to support each other when we come out of it too because Hong Kong is a great place. I mean, I, I was here during SARS. I've been here through the dot-com bubble. Hong Kong can take a hit, but, man, also it can bounce back. And that's, yeah, that's one of the so best true. things about this city. That's absolutely so true and that's so worth hanging on to because it gives you that sense of hope and it gives you that that view of a positive future. And I think that's really, really important when we're facing something like this. How do you see the difference between this pandemic and SARS, given that you were here in SARS? I think that, well, for a start, I mean, I, I think the doctors got on top of SARS very, very well. I mean, I can't remember the exact timeline of when SARS started to when it ended, but our doctors were remarkably strong in finding cures, finding treatment protocols, and it was very impressive. We haven't got to that stage yet with COVID-19. I'm hoping that that will come soon. It's much more global. This is just so much bigger than SARS. SARS was scary. But this is terrifying. Yeah. The difference was there was no social media during SARS. So we didn't have this kind of panic news. But people also didn't stay at home. So they went to work and they shared panic there. So there was still fear in the world. I think that Hong Kong became mask wearing, hand washing, obsessed individuals during SARS. And as soon as COVID-19 showed itself into the community here, we went back to our SARS protocols. We also benefited very much from SARS. We have lots of places that have automatic taps, automatic dryers, automatic doors. You don't have to touch a lot of surfaces. And that came directly out of SARS. So many other places do not have these hygiene-friendly practices that Hong Kong does have. I believe you were here before SARS. 
So you remember people used to spit in the street and how now you don't see this at all. There was an improvement in hygiene significantly at the SARS period. You know, that was 16 years ago. Yes, no, Hong Kong is much cleaner after SARS and they implemented fines for dropping rubbish, throwing cigarette butts and for spitting in public and that helped a lot. I think that's another reason why Hong Kong is doing so well managing this virus, even though we are seeing a spike in cases now that we're having a lot of people coming back into Hong Kong, but that's life. People do need to come home to their city. So it'll be interesting to see whether Hong Kong closes its borders because I know Taiwan and Singapore have just done that and Australia are doing it as well. I think one of the things about, I mean, and I don't know what the government will decide and I don't think any of us do. I think we all become kind of pseudo experts on talking about these things, but we really aren't. What I do like about the Hong Kong government with the quarantine is that they do tell us what they're going to do. They do tell us that they're going to do it. They don't just go ahead. So that might give you a chance to leave Hong Kong. Why do you leave Hong Kong now? I don't quite know. But if you were looking to move overseas anyway or something and you decided you didn't want to have to stay in Hong Kong, then maybe that would affect you. Maybe you'd like to be at home with your parents or your grandparents during this time. We also know that the other issue of COVID-19 is that a lot of people are asymptomatic. Jules, you and I could both actually have COVID-19 and not know. Yeah, that's a worry, isn't it? Do you think that there will be any positives that we can glean from this experience after it's over? Oh, undoubtedly there'll be a moment where we can say, oh, that started because of this. And that's why I'm also saying to people, you know, this is one of those opportunities in history where you get to define what kind of person you're going to be. Are you going to be part of the solution or are you going to continue to be part of the problem? Because when you, when this does go, and it will, this is how you will be seen. You will be seen as a person who promoted help or was a troublemaker. So think of these things. This is a good opportunity for you to say, how do I want to be seen in my community? Yeah, absolutely. And finally, just to finish up, what are some of the personal takeaways from this unique time in history that you have gleaned from all of this experience? Despite being a psychologist, you know, that doesn't make me a superior being. I'm still a control freak, just like everybody else. And I've had to confront my own lack of ability to control stuff. This has not been easy for me. I don't suffer from anxiety. I suffer from control. The situation is out of my control. And it has been good for me to take a break and say, okay, what can you control and what can't you control? What I can control is my own environment. What messages I let inside my head, how I let my body respond, how I let my children react to the situation, what kind of person I'm going to be to my friends, to my community. Those things I can control. I cannot control this pandemic. Yeah, exactly. That's really good advice. And I think that really resonates with me a lot as well. I can relate to that very much, as I'm sure many of our listeners will be able to as well. Is there anything else that you would like to add before we close off this really, really insightful interview? Thank you so much. I'm going to ask you, Jules, if you can put my contacts at the end of the podcast as well. Is if people want to have journaling pages, I have journaling pages. If you write to me, I will start sending you some of my journaling pages. That's at no cost. I'm quite happy to send them to people in the community. They're just prompts. I've written actually a COVID-19 book, a coloring and reflection book at this point in time that I've been sharing with people who for free because it's just reflections you can do now because there's always something about this period in your life that says something about you. For example, I'm a control freak. I have to look at those things. I might not want to look at those things, but I have no choice but to look at those things now how we deal with conflict in our relationships. When we are living with our partners 24-7, then if you have a weird conflict relationship with your partner, it's probably going to become a problem. So we have an opportunity for reflection. So if you want to do some journaling, I can give you access to that. Do not struggle on on your own, but also you know, communicate with your friends, but make sure that they're also helping you feel good and you're helping them feel So if people want to get in touch with you, Angela, or they'd like some sort of support psychologically, mentally, emotionally with journals, joining your book club or getting on board with any of your other initiatives, how can they do that? I'll give Jules my details for my email and um, I'm on Facebook 
and Red Door is on Facebook as well. So you can find me those ways. As I say, don't struggle. You are not alone. You may be on your own, but you are not alone. And you are as alone as you want to be in this. Try to stay connected to people. Try to be connected to yourself. This is not an easy time. And it's just about learning to adjust and doing things differently, finding a different way to connect, finding a different way to reach out for help, finding a different way to keep yourself calm and positive. And sometimes it's it's okay to not be okay. Yeah, and to then reach out and talk to somebody about it because you will feel so much better than managing when you're not feeling okay on your own. It's a really important message whether it's a friend, whether it's a counsellor, whether it's your GP. And many, many people are adapting now to doing stuff online. So people, if you want to get in touch with Angela, you can look on the show notes to get her details and do get in touch. So Angela, thank you so much for this really, really insightful interview. And it was a great experience for me to do my first online interview in 133 episodes my first one I've done online and not in person due to the virus. So thank you so much. It's been really, really wonderful. Thank you, Jules. Thank you for all you do. And for my listeners out there, if you could rate and review us, that will help me move up iTunes and help to get the message out to people about how to manage their stress and anxiety during COVID-19. And for my patrons, I'm going to do four secret questions now with Angela that she doesn't know anything about. And that's going to go on patreon.com. And if you go onto patreon.com forward slash Hong Kong confidential for as little as one US dollar a month, you can hear Angela's answers to the four secret questions and also the answers of my previous 15 guests to the secret questions as well. It's always a lot of fun. And thank you to all of my confidants out there who are supporting Hong Kong Confidential. So we're going to sign off now, Angela, and say goodbye, and then we're going to do the secret questions separately. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thanks, Angela, for coming on the show. Welcome. So that brings us to the end of another Hong Kong Confidential podcast. I'm Jules Hannaford. Thanks for joining me, and I hope you'll be with me again next week. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please can you go to iTunes to rate and review it. I would really appreciate your feedback. You can email me at jules at hongkongconfidential.net and you can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Hong Kong Confidential. If you'd like to hit me up on Twitter, it's at Jules Hannaford. I would love to hear from you. Love this podcast? Support it and sponsor today. Simply head to oscastnetwork.com for details.